Hi everybody, welcome to Amy Nolte Music. I want to tell you about the last time I went to New York City. I went up to this club called Smoke and I was going to sit in with the piano player singer Johnny O'Neill. There was one point in the set where Johnny and his trio were swinging so super hard. John was sitting right there next to me, my husband. He and I just wanted to jump out of our skin. They were swinging so hard. And pretty much everybody in the club had to restrain themselves from getting up and just boogieing down. There was this one guy over in the corner who caught my eye, and I could see that he was having a super hard time restraining himself. I was thinking, if anybody's going to start boogieing down, it's going to be this guy. But instead of engaging in the boogie, he opted for the clap. Spirit moved him. And he started clapping for all he was worth. He couldn't stop himself. The band was swinging so hard. Now this kind of begs the question, is it appropriate to clap in an intimate jazz setting, no matter how hard the band is swinging? I'm going to leave that question for a little bit later. Well, this guy was going to clap town. But unfortunately, he had kind of hopped on the square train to clap town. He was clapping on one and three. Bless his heart. Now, he couldn't help it, and it was pretty endearing, actually, to watch him just in reckless abandon, clapping away the best he knew how. And although most of the room was aware of his rhythmic faux pas, that was kind of far from the worst of the situation. Johnny heard it. He couldn't help but hearing it. It's not a very big room. I kind of watched him look up at the guy, Look down at his hands, keep playing, trying his best to hold it together, looking up at the guy again, maybe hoping the guy would look at him. It got awkward. Everybody in the room knew it, except for that guy, of course. Finally, Johnny O'Neill shook his head, said, hold on. He stopped the band and he just looked over into the corner and he goes, come on, somebody show this guy how to clap. You don't clap on one and three, man. And then he just, and then he just goes, I gotta take, I gotta take a break. And uh, at which point he actually decided it was a good time for me to come sit in. Tell you what, the crowd was primed for Amy. <laughs> Back to my question though, there are a lot of concert settings where it's cool to clap or okay to clap and actually a lot of concert settings where you can actually see the performer up on the stage, you know, give you like a nice cue and they want you to clap. That happens often. I am going to suggest that unless the performer asks you to do it though and you're in a small room like that, it might be a good idea to just <laughs> hold on to that energy. Ah, Johnny had built that huge, swinging, amazing, beautiful groove that night and, and just in that moment it was all taken away. Have you ever heard Johnny O'Neill swing? Now we're going to play some straight ahead. We're going to swing some right down the middle. He didn't have any idea that one and three were not the correct beats to clap on. Nobody ever taught him that. That's the same. Same with so many people in the world. Nobody ever taught them that. So you can't fault the guy at all. And you can't fault Johnny O'Neill for wanting to have a good feeling while he was playing his music. It was just kind of an impossible situation. You know, although you may not realize it, so many kinds of music depend on a strong two and four backbeat to really push their groove and make things feel good. Even the incomparable Justin Bieber can throw down a groove and get upset when people happen to clap and get it wrong. Stop, 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 stop. It's like this. Clap. Clap. If you're gonna clap, if not, yeah, at least clap on beat. <laughs> Justin couldn't just sit back and let that happen to his groove either. People are kind of protective of their grooves, as it turns out. Now, jazz players love the example of Harry Connick Jr. live in concert actually coming up with a crazy good solution to this problem. In a very epic moment, he stealthily and 
skillfully maneuvered himself around a crowd that just wasn't as hip as they felt like they were. The whole crowd was clapping on one and three, and you can watch it in Harry's face as he sees this happening. I love to be invited once with it. But he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't really show it. I think you can see the wheels kind of spinning in there and see him thinking, I'm going to wait for my moment and fix this. He actually helped out the whole crowd. He tricked them all and he shifted their clapping from one and three to two and four without them ever even knowing it by adding a bar of five, four. It was really smart. Let me throw it up on the screen again for you and I'll have numbers flashing by so you can see where the five, four bar is and how the accent switches from one and three to two and four. And it's a cool clip, not just because of what Harry Connick Jr. does, but because of the way the whole feel of the groove changes, absolutely dependent on what the audience is adding to the performance. And kudos to Harry because he didn't have to stop everybody and kill that vibe that was happening at the concert. They were all so stoked to be listening to him play that swinging New Orleans feel. And he didn't want to kill that for them, so he didn't. I mean, he just fixed it. That's pretty cool. So is it ever okay to clap on one and three? In the right setting, heck yes! <laughs> dang well in that setting, doesn't it? I love this clip of Hal Galper. Hal Galper is a wonderful jazz piano player and a good educator, and when I was in college, he actually came and did this same kind of thing for me that I'm going to show you right now. He has a volunteer come up and he asks if anybody has been practicing working on a really hard lick. Now let me show you the difference between playing in 4-4 and playing in halftime. This will double your chops immediately. Okay. Okay. You know like a, a C7 bebop scale, right? Yeah. Okay. Play it up and down. Uh, one handed is fine. And tap quarter notes with your feet. One, two, three, four. Now tap on one and three and do it. my hand in back in college because I had been working on this Miles Davis line that I learned that went and that was hard for me and so I had this lick I'd been working on and he sat me down at the piano and he said all right I'd like you to put your metronome on you have your metronome I always did in my backpack I put my metronome on I said it he said set it to two and four and, and try your lick and I did and so like that, and uh, and I, I didn't it didn't come off just right. I had to do it a couple of times, and um, and he said, all right, now now let's shift it, put it on one and three. So I didn't actually have to change the metronome. It was still you know, but I but I changed my mindset. So instead of it being on one two three four one two, I just stopped my brain and switched it from one. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, like that. And all of a sudden, I nailed it. It was fluid, it was smooth, and Hal had proved his point, which is that the pulse on one and three can really make you relax. There was something about the pulse on two and four that propelled me forward, made me a little jumpier, a little more anxious, and I couldn't play that lick just like I wanted to, but as soon as he placed the beat on one and three, everything changed for me. There's this story that I absolutely love about the production of Benny and the Jets, the classic Elton John hit. They had laid down every track, everything was fine, but when they were in the studio trying to get it just right for release, 
Something just didn't feel right about it. It seemed really empty. And the producer, Gus Dudgeon, I don't know if I say his name right, Gus Dudgeon, I don't know how he had the idea, but he just took some concert sound from one of Elton John's earlier concerts, just the ambient sound of the crowd during the concert, and most importantly, the crowd in a very British manner, apparently, clapping on one and three. And he just pumped it into the song to see how it would sound. I think he also took something from Jimi Hendrix as well and pumped it into that track. Anyway, it's amazing because a track that kind of felt empty and like it was needing something or lacking something, all of a sudden was fixed by some ambient noise and a one and three clap. Can you hear it? Think what would happen if I changed my clap to two and four. It's no good. All of a sudden, I seem like the off guy in the corner who doesn't know what he's doing. For some reason, that groove sits so nicely with a one and three. Boop, 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 Benny and the Jets. Bop, 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 da, 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 da. Can you feel how you just sit there? You just sit there. It just grounds you every time that it happens. If it were on two and four, it wouldn't ground you and make you sit tight anymore. It would push you ahead. But ba ba bunny and the jets da 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 right all of a sudden it feels like I got somewhere to go. It's crazy. That's how it is. Let's take a look at another groove that I love by Frank Ocean. Sit tight on the one and three. And if you think about it in your head, you can even kind of sing Benny and the Jets along with it because it's that slow kind of groove that's actually uh, broken up by a 16th note. Check it out. Too many bottles of this wine we can't pronounce. Too many bottles. Right? Sits. Mm. If you were to do the offbeat clap. It's just wrong. So that same lesson that Hal Galper taught me about how the one and three pulse can make me relax can work in your grooves too. You hear that Frank Ocean beat, super rich kids. All you want to do is just, mm, just sit back and relax. Even though sometimes uh, some of us get a bad rap for being the ones to clap on one and three. Now, our Caucasian brothers and sisters, many of them, clap on the one and three. We probably deserve it. Uh, somehow, those of us with some European ancestry probably have some kind of a cultural innate um, desire or need to clap on the one and three or to feel music with that pulse. But it really does depend on what kind of music you've grown up listening to, where you feel the desire to place that pulse. And with enough exposure to the right music, anybody can learn to clap on two and four because so much of our music needs a two and four clap. And we actually couldn't imagine it if it wasn't that way. Think about Michael Jackson. A pretty baby with the high heels on. You give me fever like I never ever known. That two and four is crucial. The backbeat. It just gives you what it just gives you what you need to feel like you're in that song. And if we were to change it to the one and three, that song wouldn't feel right at all anymore. A pretty baby with a high heels on. Everything's different. You need that. Pretty baby with a it's like it gives you something to look forward to. Here it comes, ah, here it comes, right? Yeah. Let's take a second and listen to one of the groovinest songs I can think of with a strong two and four backbeat. Boogie Shoes by Casey and the Sunshine Band. Again, strong two and four. You listen to gospel choirs or people singing in church, their clapping is almost always going to be on two and four, at least if the four four time signature is happening. Gives you a kind of feeling inside that you just 
can't hardly explain, but it drives and it pushes. Now, if you're unsure, if you, if you don't think that you've got a grasp on how to clap on two and four, just if you're at a concert and people start clapping or you feel like you want to start clapping, don't do it. Just don't be the first one to do it. Just wait until the people next to you start clapping and you can join them. Hopefully they're right. But, you know, do take my cue. I, I don't ever start clapping unless somebody invites me to just because they work hard to build what they've got on that stage in that moment. And I don't know that it's my job to take that away from them unless they ask me to and then I add to it and I do it with all my soul. Because if they invite me to be a part of their performance, I'm there. But until then, I can sit tight. I get it if the spirit moves you. It can be really hard. I also challenge you in your writing, in your bands, whatever kind of music you're coming up with, give yourself a little challenge, maybe to write something with a one in three type of groove. If it's done right, it can really make you feel dang good. Pay attention to it. Try to find some more songs for me that have a nice one in three feel. Two and four is everywhere. That's not hard to find. But a good one in three groove and beat is kind of a rarity. And I challenge you to find some and tell me about it. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Also, before I go, if you would like to get your own Amy Nolte gear, click on the link above my head. You can customize your own t-shirt or hat or apron or dog bandana or water bottle or phone case. You can make it any color. Whatever you want. It's pretty fun. And don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time on Amy Nolte Music.